Now let's do a few examples where we will see how we apply Newton Euler equations to solve the problems for rigid bodies moving in a plane. So the first one is example 7.1 from your textbook and this is maximum acceleration of a motorcycle. So in this problem what we have is a motorcycle okay all right so I'm going to try to draw this and there is also a rider on a motorcycle okay and that's the horizontal surface where this is going to be uh, hidden. This is the direction of the motion. So for the motorcycle and a rider shown in the figure with a combined weight of 650 pounds, so we know the total mass, this is the mass of the rider and the motorcycle combined, determine the maximum possible acceleration such that motorcycle does not pop a wheelie. Okay, so we're looking for, so find, we're looking for maximum acceleration such that the motorcycle does not pop a wheelie. What is popping a wheelie? Well, if you have ever, you know, ridden a motorcycle or anything of that sort, you know that if you accelerate too much, all of a sudden you increase the velocity, your front wheels come off the ground, right? So if you have, you know, just one thing in your front wheel, then it'll come off the ground. Um, and that's called popping a wheelie. So when the wheels come off the ground, then the normal reaction on the front wheels would be zero. So we're looking for that maximum acceleration that you can uh, provide to the motorcycle before it will pop a wheelie and find the minimum value of mu s compatible with this motion. So what is the minimum static coefficient of friction that you would need before the before the motorcycle would slip, right? So if you have too much acceleration, then the motorcycle can slip also. So what is that minimum uh, acceleration, min minimum coefficient of friction that you would need to support this maximum acceleration? Treat the rider and motorcycle as a single rigid body. So what we're saying is that the rider is not really moving related to the rigid body. So you can treat both the rider as well as the motorcycle as a single rigid body. Assume that the motorcycle is driven by its rear wheel, which means that the engine is applying a torque only on the rear wheel. Okay, so front wheels are essentially, you know, passive rolling wheels. There is no torque applied on the front wheel. Ignore the rotational inertia of the front wheel and use the dimension shown in the figure. Okay, so in, in the figure you have shown some dimensions as well. So what we know is the location of the center of mass, G, and you know uh, what these distances are. So we'll, this point is being called A, this point is being called B. Actually they're on the ground, but you know, because of my drawing, they, are, they look like off the ground. The distance between A and B is given as W. And from G to the road, the vertical distance is h, all right, and uh, the distance between g and b is given as d, okay. So we know all these distances, okay. So you can see that um, the center of mass is uh, offset, right, from right from being in, right in the middle of the uh, the two wheel center, okay. All right, so. How do we solve this problem? Well, we start with our step one, which is to show the coordinate system. That's this is positive f, that's positive y. And then the step two, step two is to perform as much kinematic analysis as we can, right? And the goal is to get the acceleration of center of mass as well as the angular acceleration. Now, this motorcycle is really not rotating, which means it is actually translating. It's moving only along a straight line direction. That means we know from that that alpha is zero. There's no angular acceleration. It has no angular velocity. It has no angular acceleration because it's translating. What about acceleration of center of mass? Well, that's something we have to find out, right? Okay, so we don't know that, but kinematic analysis revealed to us that at least the angular acceleration is zero, all right? Then the step three is to draw the free body diagram, right? So let's draw free body diagram. So we have the wheels, right? And then we have, you know, the motorcycle, and then we have the rider, okay? That's point A, that's point B, normal reaction at these two points. There is a center of mass, so I'm drawing it here. So that's the weight, this is the G, okay? Then on the rear wheels, of course, you'll have the friction because the torque is applied only on the rear wheels. If there is no friction, then the motorcycle is not going to go anywhere. So we'll call it F sub A. And it's going to point in the horizontal in the horizontal direction towards the direction of motion to propel it, right? And then the torque, of course, would be applied by the engine over here, right? So there will be a moment applied by the engine on the rear wheel that would try to rotate the wheels clockwise, which will overcome the friction, the moment from the friction, right? 
So these are the forces acting on the rigid body, right? No friction force on the rear, on the front wheel because front wheel is not a driven wheel, okay? All right, so now we can use the Newton Leiter equation. First one is sigma f equal to m times acceleration of center of mass, okay? And the acceleration of center of mass is m a g i hat plus zero j hat because the motorcycle is moving along x direction. So, you know, we could have actually written over here that a g is equal to a g i hat, right? That could have been okay too. What are the force in the horizontal direction? We have f a i hat plus n a plus n b minus m g j hat. So, those, that's on the left hand side. So, that gives us f a equal to m times a g and n a plus n b is equal to m g. Okay, so we get that from the newton alice first law. The second law says that we can take moment about center of mass and that should be equal to i g alpha, but we have seen alpha is zero, so sigma m g is zero. That means we can take moment of all the forces about center of mass and that should be equal to zero. So let's do that. So we have n b, the moment of n b about g is equal to n b times d, and that's counterclockwise, so that's positive, plus f a times h, that's also positive, minus n a times, and that is actually w minus d, right? So w minus d. So if you see here over here, so that's a w, that's d, so that's w a minus d, and that should be equal to zero, okay? All right. So these are the equations that we really have, right? So you have one, you have two, and we have three over here, okay? So how many unknowns we have? We have F A, we have, so let's, let's you know, count them, F A, N A, N B, as well as acceleration A G. So you have like four equations. Of course, we cannot solve for all of them just from this. So let's see if there is anything that we have not taken into account, right? So first thing is that you are given that you have to find the maximum acceleration. So for maximum acceleration, you get into this limiting case when the normal reaction at point B would be zero because you'll be popping a wheelie. So when you get to the, the limiting case when acceleration, when AG is actually A max, that's when normal reaction at point B would be zero. So we got rid of one variable from that. At the same time, you don't want the motorcycle to slip. That means that the friction force over here should be the maximum possible friction force that will be available to you. So maximum possible friction force is mu S times and A, you cannot have anything more than that, right? So that also gets rid, gets rid of one more unknown because now FA is expressed in terms of N A. So now if we substitute for all this in here, in one, two, and three, we have how many unknowns? We have only three unknowns and we have only three equations, which means we can solve for all of them, right? So if we solve for them, we get mu S to be 1.32 and maximum acceleration turns out to be 42.5 per second squared, okay? So, you know, it may look like as if this uh, static coefficient of friction 1.32 is very, very high, but, uh, you know, it, it's not unusual for, you know, good tires on, you know, asphalt kind of surface to achieve this kind of a sticky uh, friction, okay? Let's do another example. This is example 7.3, translation slipping versus tipping uh, with friction. So we have a uniform flat rate And we know its dimensions, so what we'll do is we'll call this to be D, and we will call the width to be W. Okay. So a person is pushing this flat crate, you know, right here. So by applying a force, uh, let's call that force P. Okay. And we know the magnitude of this force is 95 pounds. So given is this force P of 95 pounds. And it's acting horizontally. The force is applied 2.9 feet, 95 feet above the floor, and the crate is 5 feet long and 3 feet high. So we know the point at which this is applied. So at point D, so we know D is 2.95 feet. Uh, so that's actually the point of application of the force. Okay, the total height is slightly more than that. So we are we also know H, which is 3 feet, and we know the width, which is 5 feet. And the total mass is given as 120 pounds. This is the mass of the, uh, the crate. 
The coefficients of the static and kinetic friction between the crate and the surface are also given. So we know mu s and mu k. So mu s is 0.4 and mu k is 0.35. So static and kinetic coefficients of friction. Verify that the crate slips and does not tip and determine its acceleration. So we have to verify that this crate is actually slipping and it's not going to tip. And we want to know what its acceleration would be under those conditions. So if it were to tip, it would essentially tip about you know here right if you apply too much force on the top then you know you can see you can kind of imagine that this crate is going to you know tip it might get into a configuration like this and and the problem says that you know you should allow this this you should disallow this possibility so you want this crate to to slip now of course if you push uh, at this crate you know somewhere here then if, then you would minimize that chance of the crate slipping so now the question is first of all we have to verify that the crate is going to you know, slip and not tip right first of all would it slide or not right that's the first question we want to verify and that's easy to do because we know you know what this force p is okay so if you draw the free body diagram uh, if you draw the free body diagram you know this is what you will see and we're jumping ahead a little bit over here because our steps say that we have to show the quadrant system and then we have to do kinematic analysis which we'll come back to in a minute but you know this is something that i can do you know fairly quickly over here okay so we have the normal reaction now the reason why normal reaction is not shown to be going through the center of mass is because essentially the crate has now a size right it has it has a shape and the normal reaction from the ground on the crate is going to be a distributed force and we are now representing that distributed force via a single point force and there's no reason to believe that normal reaction would be going through the center of mass so in fact if the crate were to tip then this normal reaction would actually move in this direction and might get up to this point right if it were tipping before you know it could roll over so the normal reaction from the center of mass, let's say, is at a distance L, all right? And then we have the weight, of course, over here, and we have the friction force, right? Let's call that F sub F, okay? So we can verify that this would slip if we find that the force applied is more than the mu s times n, right? Because the maximum friction force uh, would be mu s times n. So if force P applied is more than that, then we know that the crate is going to slip. And it turns out in this particular problem that is the case because you know n over here is equal to mg right and mu s is given to you so if you compute mu s times n this comes out to be 48 pound so this comes out to be 48 pound while the p given is 95 pound right so 95 is definitely more than 48 pound that implies that this is going to be slipping okay and and basically this is just a statics analysis that you already know how to do this is not really solving the problem that the question is giving to you, okay? So let's go back to our steps, right? The first step is, of course, to show quantum system. And the second is to do as much kinematic analysis as you can, right? So we know this crate is translating, so we can say something about the acceleration that would be simply x direction acceleration plus zero j hat, right? So it just has x direction acceleration, which is something we have to determine. And it's translating, which means this angular acceleration is zero. In fact, it's omega is zero as well right okay so both of these numbers are zero now we already drawn the free body diagram so that job is done so now we can apply newton Euler equation so sigma f equal to m a g so we have the forces p we have we have uh, p minus the friction force f and that's along i hat direction plus n minus m g j hat equal to m a g uh, so that's just x direction, right? So just, I'm writing it as a m a x i hat. So we get p minus f f equal to m a x. We get n equal to m g from that. Then the second equation is sigma m g equal to i g alpha, right? And again, this is zero because alpha is zero, right? So let's take the moment about center of mass, and what do we get? We have uh, p. So moment of p is going to be d minus h by 2 right so we have we know the distance from here to here is d and that's h by 2 so that's d minus h by 2 and that will be clockwise right that will be clockwise so that's negative plus the moment of n that's n times l that's counterclockwise and then our friction force that's going to be clockwise so that's minus ff times that distance is h by 2 so h by 2 that's the total moment about central mass, and that's equal to zero, okay? 
So essentially we have here one, two, and three equations, right? Okay, so what are the things that we know? Uh, we know F, we, oh, sorry, we know P. We don't know what friction force FF is, right? Well, actually we know because we know we know that it is actually slipping. So FF is actually equal to mu kn. So FF is equal to mu kn. Let's say that's equation number four. So FF is known, P is known, uh, and then N is known as mg, so which means FF is completely known. Then AX is not known over here, so that's one unknown. And then we have L as the other unknown, which we don't know, right? So L is the other unknown because we don't know where the normal reaction is actually working. If it turns out that we compute the L and the L is goes beyond the beyond, beyond the, the size of this crate, right? So if L is more than, let's say it turns out that L is more than the half the width, right? If it L is more than that, then we know that crate is actually going to tip, right? Otherwise, we know that uh, it's not going to tip, right? So if you solve this problem by substituting for all the numbers that, that are given to you, and it's easy to do now, then you find that L is equal to 1.673 feet, okay? And if we compare it with, you know, what the total width is, which is 5 feet, so half of that is 2.5 feet, you can see that this is less than 2.5 feet. This is less than 2.5 feet, which means that the normal reaction would be always in the base of the crate. And that means that the crate is actually not going to tip. So let's look at this again. So how did we solve this problem? We started with the coordinate system. We did the kinematic analysis. And while doing the kinematic analysis, we actually assumed that the crate is uh, not going to tip, right? We said that it's going to slip, it's not going to tip. And on the basis of that, we did the analysis and verified it. You could have assumed that the tip, that the crate was actually tipping. And that means that you would actually show the normal reaction right over here. And that means you would actually know where it was acting. But if you assume that and you did the analysis, you would probably find that the motion that ensued from that assumption is actually not a valid one, okay? There would be something contradictory about that motion or you know, maybe an impossible motion. And that means that you would have to revise your assumption and go back to solving this problem without assuming the actual tipping. 